Hello, Frank Lloyd Wright fans, fans of organic architecture, fans of modern architecture. I'm Colin Slace, architect. And today we're going to do something different. Normally, I'm your tour guide through uh, touring different Frank Lloyd Wright houses that my wife and I have stayed in and other uh, travels I've had around the country for since the 90s. But today on this YouTube channel, we are going to do something different. We're going to do a critical analysis of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. We're going to review many, if not all, of the criticisms of his, of his work, such as low ceilings, leaky, saggy roofs, dark interiors, windows that let air in, things like that. Um, but it's not going to just be a bash on Frank Lloyd Wright video. The most exciting thing about Frank Lloyd Wright's work and about today is that we can do better with technology, with materials. Today, we can improve upon what Mr. Wright was trying to do. We can build upon his principles. And so I think this is the first YouTube or the only YouTube video on Frank Lloyd Wright that is going to be a critical analysis, a critical review of his work. Um, but we're going to offer solutions. We're going to talk about how we can do better today, how we can build upon Frank Lloyd Wright's work and his principles and progress and update organic architecture into today and beyond and in the future. So let's get right to it and um, start the slides here and you will see what we're talking about and go from here. So um, again, this is called Frank Lloyd Wright, a critical review and what we can improve. And as I said, I think it's the only critical review of Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright's work on YouTube. Um, there's a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright information on YouTube. It's great. I look at it every day just about New things come up, tours of his houses and buildings, um, other informative um, uh, talks and seminars and, and things from other people. And that's great. But it's usually a, a critical review you know, or, or it's, it's usually uh, a tour of his houses or it's um, just showing his work, but not critically reviewing it. And so what I wanted to do was look into rather than at, as Frank Lloyd Wright used to say, and understand the nature of the work, the nature of the principles, but also look at the shortcomings or what people would consider criticisms and build upon those and see how we can improve upon them and be better today. I mean, we all know the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright, greatest architect of all time, but if that was the greatest of all time in the 1950s, think then of what we can do now in the 2020s and beyond. So here's the list that I came up with of criticisms, general criticisms I've read or heard about uh, throughout the years of his work. So we'll go through these really quickly. And then this, the next slides will be taking each one of these and just briefly going through them, showing some slides, and then talking about how we can do better today. So leaky, saggy roofs. Um, we hear about those complaints of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. Um, flat roofs, sometimes inappropriate. Uh, for instance, the Brandis House in Washington uh, near the Seattle area, very wet area. I've been there many times. Um, a flat roof in that area, man, that's, that's gutsy <laughs> because it rains and it is wet all the time. So we'll talk about that. Small entries, sometimes leading into walls and or hallways. Um, typical uh, Frank Lloyd Wright strategy is compression and release. So small entries. Um, but, you know, today, uh, most people would have a problem with that or criticize that. So we're, let, let, let's address that. So in, in other words, what I'm going to do is in this video is let's address these criticisms. And if, and if we can improve upon all of them or some of them, I think that'll make Frank Lloyd Wright's work even more accessible to more of the public today. And um, like I said, hopefully we can improve upon some of these things. 
Um, more criticisms of his work, small bedrooms, small bathrooms, and kitchen. We all, we all know today everybody wants the gourmet kitchen, um, small bedrooms. Uh, you know, again, Mr. Wright had his reasons for all of these things, um, and we'll get into those. But uh, again, let's address these in, in, in 2022 and beyond. Uh, small doorways, narrow hallways um, are criticism. Dark interiors, you know, with the, the brick and the wood and the Cherokee red concrete floors, sometimes the, the interiors can be kind of dark um, despite all of his windows. Low ceilings, Mr. Wright was five feet, eight and a half inches tall, or so we hear. <laughs> or read about. Um, he designed buildings according to the human scale, which in his case was his scale. But again, um, some ceilings get to be six feet six, six feet eight, and um, they do get to be very low. Um, and again, a lot of people are going to have a problem with that. Energy inefficient, poorly insulated, or even uninsulated in a lot of cases. <clears throat> um, you know, insulation just wasn't a you know, we didn't have climate change uh, that we knew about uh, then. It wasn't in the forefront. It wasn't in the codes. There weren't energy codes then. So we're addressing some of these things actually now just by code. Continuous expensive maintenance, um, the wood board and batten siding on the Pope Leahy house, the Bernard Schwartz house, um, you know, that wood out in the, in, in the, in the elements, um, it's going to need quite a bit of maintenance, and it's going to be continuous to keep that looking really, really good. Monotonous material and color, too much wood stone in the interior. So again, you know, a lot of times Mr. Wright would do wood walls, wood ceiling, wood built-ins, all the same wood, the same stain color. And uh, with the Cherokee red floors, you'll see in the slides coming up that that can get somewhat monotonous. Now, Mr. Wright did do white white plaster ceilings in many of his houses in the in the mid to late 50s as well. Um, but in the slides that I'm going to show, um, you'll see that there, there can definitely be a monotony, sort of a sort of just one color sort of dominates throughout. Um, <clears throat> criticisms of his work being too controlling, the built-in furniture, the overall design is all right. Um, many of you know Frank Lloyd Wright designed plates, <clears throat> uh, designed a, a dress for one of his clients uh, back in the early 1900s. Um, again, if, if you let him, he would design everything. Again, there are reasons why, and we can get into those. Um, and again, this is not to bash on Frank Lloyd Wright. It's to understand the principles, what can be improved for today's society, for what people um, uh, sort of expect today and how we can uh, build upon and improve upon these things. Um, you know, in other words, let's address these criticisms and try to omit a lot of them. Uh, straight masculine lines, all yang, no yin. Um, again, a lot of people would say it's very masculine, these straight lines, there's no curve, there's no softness, there's no counter to these straight masculine lines. Um, no balance between yin and, yin and yang if you're into feng shui. So we'll talk about that. Plain facade facing the street, you know, it greets you with its back like storage. We'll show a few slides of that. Criticism of, you know, the windowless fronts um, facing, the, facing the graveled forecourt and the street um, can be kind of a little, um, can kind of put you off um, and not be very welcoming. So we'll talk about that. Horizontality, not always appropriate to the site, especially if it's mountainous. Uh, Mr. Wright stressed the horizontal throughout his entire career in relationship to the prairie. But if you're in Colorado or the Smoky Mountains or uh, certain sites um, where it's more about the vertical or more about the slope, maybe horizontality is not necessarily appropriate because you're not relating to the prairie in those situations. Kitchen somewhat concealed from the living, dining, and view. Even though Mr. Wright invented the open plan, um, his kitchens, or what he called workspaces, were still somewhat concealed, if not fully concealed. But nowadays, of course, we, we have opened the kitchen completely to the living and dining. So this one, we, we're, we pretty much have addressed. Um, planning grids can be restrictive. 
<clears throat> I will show you some slides on how that is the case, um, where you know Mr. Wright sometimes doesn't even adhere to the grid with a, an occasional wall or two, and we'll take a look at that. And then finally, the budget being greatly exceeded, usually as a, as a surprise to the client. Um, I think we a lot of us have heard about the budgets being greatly exceeded. And in today's society, with as litigious as a, as a society as we are, um, that's just much, much less tolerated, if not completely unacceptable today. Today, we try to inform the client early on along the way of the budget. We get cost estimates um, so we can know that beforehand um, instead of finishing the construction drawings or even during or after construction, then the client finding out we're way over budget, uh, then that's a very uncomfortable situation for the client and the architect. So leaky, saggy roofs. Uh, again, you can kind of see this sag here in this roof. I don't know if maybe that was for drainage, but today, you know, we would, we would, this is called a fascia, by the way, we'd make that fascia straight and then we would slope just the roofing on top of the fascia so that it would still appear straight. With engineering today, with codes, um, you know, this is, is, you know, all the structural engineers I work with, uh, obviously this is, this is detested and is not going to be acceptable. So the structural engineers today, of course, you know, it's very beefy as we call it. Structure is very um, sort of uh, designed with a lot of redundancy in it. And so, you know, I think, I think we're, we're addressing this today. Now, again, you know, some of these roofs are, you know, 70 years old. So you might have some sag after some time. And again, Mr. Wright it was constructing these roofs out of two by fours because of the extremely low budget on these houses. Um, but today with codes and with structural engineering and calculations and um, requirements, um, this is just, you know, with, with roof loads today, with solar panel loads, wind loads, dead and live loads, we're, we're just, you're just hopefully not going to see this uh, in, the, in your buildings today. Um, this is the Bernard Schwartz house. You know, you can see some sag here. You can see some sag here a little bit. You know, you can see some, some kind of waviness in these flat roofs. Again, you know, Mr. Wright, look at how thin this is. There's probably steel in here. This is this cantilevered carport. Um, you know, again, Wright didn't have, uh, you know, the budget to do, to, to structure that maybe the way it should have been or he would have wanted. Um, but today, uh, uh, just again, in, in the projects I've worked on, uh, boy, the structural engineer is going to be all over this cantilever. And uh, that's going to be, that's just going to be really beefed up. And um, it's just not going to be tolerated to have any sag in there for many, many decades. Again, this house is, you know, I don't know, it was built in the 40s. So, you know, we're talking almost 80 years old. And again, we're talking out of materials here that um, might not have been ideal at the time, uh, even for Frank Lloyd Wright. But again, we're, this, is, this is being addressed by code and by structural engineering today. Um, so, so it's improving. Uh, leaks, you know, this is just a, a picture here of a leak at Talia's and West. Um, you know, we've all heard the stories about some leaking in Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. Again, <clears throat> with today's, <clears throat> excuse me, with today's codes, with flashing details, with water resistive barriers, um, I think, uh, that's being addressed. And again, with uh, a litigious society as we are today with lawyers, um, architects really, really try to um, detail uh, their buildings um, in ways that water is just not gonna penetrate. So again, just completely unacceptable today. Um, the Willie House, find an article here um, of uh, some complaint here, Nancy complaining to the architecture, to the architect that the moisture was entering the house through gaps caused by seasonal expansion between the roof and the chimney. Wright responded with the instructions of the tops of the chimney and walls should be coated twice with rubberoid mastic. This will solve your problem. It didn't. Um, the wing spread, the Herbert Johnson house, um, one of his grandsons or great, great grandsons here, Looks like talking about the story of at a formal dinner party, 
um, of a sudden thunderstorm sent a stream of water down on Herbert Johnson's head as he presided over the table. Um, in righteous anger, he put a call to Frank Lloyd Wright, told him that wing spread was beautiful, but it had a leaky roof and water was leaking right on top of his head, to which Wright replied, well, Hib, why don't you move your chair? So those kinds of stories. So um, leaky roofs shouldn't be happening today. So code and just um, good detailing and just, I think, improved construction quality and techniques, I think, are addressing that that issue today much better. So, so far so good. Small entries, um, this is a big one, <laughs> excuse the pun, but here's the Krauss house. You enter right behind this slide, you know, and you sort of enter right into this wall and you sort of have to walk down this hallway to get into the living room over here. Um, and here's the floor plan of that. So you enter this small space, right, sort of, you sort of hit right into this wall you have to turn, go down this sort of hallway to get into the living room. Again, you know, Mr. Wright did that to compress the space and make the contrast and the feeling of entering to a small space here. In, in contrast, the large, higher ceiling, larger space with the glass living room, the contrast between those two is sort of exacerbated. But today, um, that would be very criticized by most, if not everybody today. So today, you know, let, let's maybe try to make these entries a little bit bigger. You, you can still have the lower ceiling and, and still have, you know, a smaller space here. I mean, you know, nowadays people want huge foyers with big staircases and 30 foot ceilings. Um, we don't have to go that extreme, but let, let's address this criticism of, of this being fairly small here and cramped. Um, I like to leave enough space where, you know, two or a couple of people, husband, wife or so can greet, um, you know, two or more guests in the, in the entry space with enough room for that. And then you can move into the rest of the house. Same thing here with the Zimmerman house. You come into a small entry and you come in and you hit this wall. Um, if you've watched a lot of the HGTV shows, um, where, where this is a situation, the first thing they talk about is, yeah, let's remove this wall and open it up. Now, here you wouldn't want to do that because Mr. Wright has placed the workspace um, behind the wall. But again, addressing this, opening this, uh, you know, making, if we can make this entry space a little bit bigger, um, I, I think that would really help address that criticism. Um, here again, I've, I've stretched this slide to fit the screen, but again, the entry is here and you come into this little hallway, you hit this wall, and then you have to turn and come into the living room. So let's, let's if we can maybe even just make this entry space a little bit bigger, I think that will at least somewhat address that criticism. And we can improve upon that. Small bedrooms, Mr. Wright used or designed small bedrooms to save square footage because budgets were low. And he also felt that bedrooms were, were simply for sleeping. Um, and for doing homework. Um, so in kids' bedrooms, it would be the bed, a de built-in desk for homework, some storage, windows, closet behind. Um, but again, uh, this would be very, very criticized today. But you know, Mr. Wright treated bedrooms as almost like cabins on uh, trains or boats. Um, but again, uh, you know, using the space just for sleeping, Mr. Wright wanted you to uh, be with the family down in the living room in the large expansive living room or outside in nature. Um, but this would be criticized today. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is the Penfield house. Uh, again, small bedrooms showing the bed, desk, and then the small closet. Um, this would just be unacceptable today. So let's, you know, if we can try to make these bedrooms a little bit bigger. Um, especially for resale value today. Uh, I mean, this, this would actually decrease the value of the home and make it harder to sell today just because so much of society today is going to expect this bedroom to be bigger. Um, this is that same bedroom. So again, you see the desk, the bed. Beautiful views um, out the windows to nature beyond. That's a plus and that's wonderful. And this is much better than we do today. You know, today it would be a wall with a, a hole punched out of it to look out of. 
So this is great. Um, but again, if we can make these bedrooms a little bit bigger than Mr. Wright did, I think that will at least begin to address that issue. Uh, the, the Palmer House in Michigan, again, small bedrooms, bed, desk, some built-in storage, small closet. Um, that's just, you know, everybody, every, everybody is going to walk into that today and say, gosh, this is really small. And they're going to talk about tearing walls down and how can we maybe make it bigger. Um, it's just the difference between today and 70, 80 years ago. Here is that bedroom with the built-in desk, um, the bed, the built-in bookshelves, uh, but again, very small and a criticism, um, especially in today's world. Small doors, narrow halls. Um, again, I mean, in the houses I've been in, I mean, sometimes these doors are two feet wide because he's adhering to the four-foot module or the two-foot module. Um, pretty narrow. Uh, narrow hallways, but again, Mr. Wright's trying to save square footage, low budget, doesn't want to dedicate a lot of square footage to, to hallways where you're simply walking through them to get to other spaces. But again, you know, today, this would be criticized. Not many people would like this. Um, so let's try to, if we can today, let's try to make this a little bit wider. Code minimum is three feet anyway. Um, but even that would be would be pushing it for most people. Um, but uh, uh, so if we can address that today, make that a little bit wider, I think then then that criticism will be addressed. Uh, this is the, the Palmer House again. Again, the distance between this shelf and this and this wall. I can't remember what that distance is, but it, it's probably not more than maybe 30 inches, two foot six, two foot eight, maybe. Uh, again, so tight. Now, Mr. Wright uses the hallway here, or what he called the gallery, for storage, and that's great. It's a wonderful functional use of the space, and it's a great idea. But most people are going to have a problem with this, and it's and, and it's, it's going to be a negative in their minds. So, if we can make that a little bit wider today, that'll help. This is looking back the other way at the hallway. Wonderful little sitting area here that Mrs. Palmer used to pay bills, make phone calls and things like that. But again, <clears throat> the width of this hallway, um, if that could be wider, that would help. Dark interiors with the concrete block houses, with the wood, um, you know, it can get dark. And obviously, you know, today, if you watch the HGTV channels, um, take note from now on, how many times people say, I want, you know, I like spaces to be light, bright, and airy. They're always going to use those three words. And in that same order, that's just what everybody is looking for. Um, and in, in Mr. Wright's uh, houses, and, you know, this is a, this is a hallway in this case, but um, this was during the day and you got to turn the lights on almost to, to, to see your way through the hallway it's just going to be criticized this as dark. So, same house here, you know, with the dark wood paneling, the gray ceiling, the gray walls. Um, most people, if not everybody, are going to say, gosh, you know, this is dark. And they're going to want to paint it white and do all kinds of things to it to quote unquote lighten it up. Now, I'm not suggesting that we go around, obviously, we don't touch Frank Lloyd Wright houses. They are. Uh, masterpieces and works of art in their own right. But today, you know, what's the inspiration we can take from this? Um, the connection to nature, um, the destruction of the box. But uh, again, if we can lighten this up, that would help. Um, again, you know, with, the, with the, the dark floors, the Cherokee red floors, the dark wood paneling, the gray walls, um, Let's just be cognitive of that today. And um, again, if we can lighten that up in some way while, at, while maintaining the organic principles of design, continuity throughout, um, but keep it light, um, I think that'll just help address this issue. Uh, again, this is the Zimmerman house. You know, the darker, the, the brick, the brown wood, the, the brown uh, cushion seat cushion material, the Cherokee red floor. 
most a lot of people are gonna say, gosh, it's it's you know kind of dark and it's gonna be kind of a uh, kind of a negative. Well, let's address that. Let's brighten it up. Again, the Zimmerman house, again, with the typically most of the materials here are on the darker side. Now it doesn't have to be white. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm suggesting maybe, you know, maybe an accent wall being a lighter color, maybe some different materials um, today. Um, but let's just be cognizant of that criticism and um, try to address it with um, having a little bit lighter materials. This is the Schwartz house, the entry to the Schwartz house. And I got to admit, I mean, yeah, that is dark. It's got a dark wood ceiling, a low ceiling, a few peekaboo windows to see outside. This is the front door here. But again, why is Mr. Wright doing this? He's purposely compressing the space, making it darker and shorter and smaller so that when you come into the living room, which is behind us, that contrast to the open living room is, is, is heightened, so to speak, and you're more wowed by the taller living room. But that said, just everybody is gonna have a problem with this. So <clears throat> let's be careful about how we treat the entry and areas of the house and um, you know, address today's criticisms, criticisms and concerns and um, try, to, try to lighten this up. At least this entry is, is bigger. I mean, this is almost, this is very generous. This is a very generous entry for a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Um, so people will, will find that favorable, but the dark materials, the few windows, the dark ceiling, um, gonna be an issue for most people. So let's be cognizant of that and, and try to make sure that we're, 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 we're making these entries welcoming and that, that people feel good in the space and then move on through the house. Low ceilings, again, back at the Schwartz house, this ceiling here, I'm six feet two, and the top of my head was almost brushing the top of the ceiling. I would say that it was maybe, this is maybe six, six. Um, it's the only ceiling in all the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings I've ever been in that I must admit did feel, I was very self-conscious of this ceiling. And I found myself, this is the Schwartz house uh, that you can rent. And it's a fabulous house in Wisconsin and Two Rivers, Wisconsin. I highly recommend renting it out. Beautiful home built in the forties. But um, I found myself sort of favoring this part of the room um, when I, you know, you sort of walk through here and then you would want to sort of get out from under that into the taller uh, part of the space. So again, uh, code won't allow a six foot six ceiling. In this case, seven foot now is the minimum. So code has somewhat addressed that, but even seven feet, everybody will find that too low. So let's just be cognizant of that. Uh, again, this is back at the Palmer house, that hallway. Uh, low ceiling. Now, th th this might have been seven feet, if that, maybe six, ten, six, eight um, low. And thus, you know, that creates uh, kind of a, a feeling of, of um, crampedness, and, and people are just going to be kind of uh, not real excited about this. Um, again, we understand why Mr. Wright did it, compressing the space saving money on the budget, even though we know later that Wright exceeded the budgets, but he was trying to give them genius uh, art, uh, architecture as a work of art for a modest budget. So he, it, we gotta commend him for trying, but it, it, if nothing else, if, this, if our ceilings maybe could be white, that would at least begin to address this issue to some degree. And Mr. Wright did do white plaster ceilings in a lot of his, his later houses in the 50s especially. Poor insulation, a lot of times it would be a, a concrete block wall, one block wide. There might be some insulation in the cells of the block, sometimes no insulation. You know, this thin roof, very little to no insulation here. Single pane glass, very thin exterior wall here. We have energy codes now. I mean, nowadays we're doing R38, sometimes R45 roof insulation, which is about a foot thick. Um, we're insulating our walls now to at least an R19 minimum. We're double painting and triple painting our glass today. So 
energy code won't allow this much glass probably, and we'll, we'll have this all being very insulated, sometimes insulation underneath the concrete floor slab. So I think, I think this is being addressed with climate change and with energy codes, um, the insulation issue is being addressed. So I think we are improving upon that. Uh, this is a house in Phoenix, the Likes house that, that is built of concrete block. And that concrete block flows right out to the exterior. This is the primary bedroom with a small uh, primary uh, terrace here or, or balcony. But again, there's probably no insulation in these concrete block walls or very little uh, vermiculite in the cells of this block. Nowadays, we'd have to fur the inside of this block with two buys, put insulation in that furring and then drywall or panel over that. Problem with that is that now you, you lose the continuity between the interior and the exterior material being the same. Look at this ceiling flowing right out to the exterior. Here's the glass line. That's what Mr. Wright was trying to do, have a total ambiguity between inside and outside. So we have to address that today um, in a way with, with, uh, with better insulation. These were probably single pane glass. <clears throat> you see all this glass, all that single pane. Today, gotta be double pane with low E, argon gas, so tinted windows. So again, I think energy code, I think that the technology of today, I mean, I think you could get single pane windows today, but gosh, that would almost probably, that would be really, really rare. Um, so we're double painting our glass. I think the glass technology has improved greatly. Window frames um, are, are better today and are, are better able to be sealed. So I think that's being addressed, but the trick today is how do we have the same material outside as inside, but yet get that insulation value? Again, this is, this is a house in, in Kansas City. Now here, I think they call out for somewhere out there, three inch bat insulation. Well, at least there is insulation here and the envelope as we call it is insulated, but today we're doing R38. So it would be 12 inches thick. It would take up this entire rafter space. <clears throat> and there's ventilation that we want today. So between ventilation and thicker insulation, I think we're addressing that. We would have double pane window here instead of single pane. Uh, in this particular house, we have concrete block. Now here there actually is what we call furring. So there is a... Um, a framing material here, and then in this case, wood paneling on the interior. Um, and there would be insulation in that furring. And in this particular case, there, I think there's stone on the exterior. So this is a better insulated wall um, with the thermal mass, with the thickness of the wall. But again, today it would still require more. So um, just need to address um, a well insulated building to reduce our HVA, our heating, ventilation, air conditioning needs, to be better to the environment, to require less energy, um, for buildings to be better sealed, better insulated, more comfortable, and hopefully, um, like I said, hopefully energy saving. Maintenance. So this is the Pope Leahy house, and you can see that wood exterior, that wood is gonna, it's gonna rot, it's gonna split, it's gonna warp, um, it's going to have to be maintained. And that's going to require a lot of work, a lot of maintenance. Today, though, the way that we can address that is we have so many materials today that we can use that require less to little, you know, little to no maintenance. Stucco, metal paneling, hardy panel or cement board come to mind. Um, so we have new materials today that we can use to address the maintenance issue. Again, back at the Schwartz house, um, the owner of this house, is in the process of, of renovating this house and, and refurbishing it and addressing these issues. But you can see that that wood is the same issue here. It's going to need work and maintenance, and it's going to need to be refinished, repaired, replaced. Um, so we have exterior materials today that we want to be low maintenance. I mean, you know, to do a real wood, you know, today we're using woods like Ipe or Ipe. Um, I don't know how it's pronounced, 
We, there are different woods today, but they're expensive. They come from foreign countries. So the cost of shipping is high. And um, uh, again, uh, other materials like stucco, metal panel, cement board um, require much less maintenance. Monotonous materials and colors. So as you can see here back at the Palmer House, wood ceiling, wood wall, wood built-ins, Cherokee red concrete floor, same wood trim around the window. A lot of people are gonna find this, there, as you look at this slide, you can see that if you sort of just put your gaze here in the middle, you're pretty much looking at a lot of brown. Um, and so that's gonna be a criticism. A lot of people are gonna take issue with that. So again, you know, today, you know, we do accent walls, what we call accent walls. We do an accent wall, a different color. A white ceiling would definitely lighten that up. The light could come in, bounce off that ceiling and come in. Um, you know, not many people doing Cherokee red concrete floors today. We could do a different color concrete floor, um, a lighter color, uh, or we could do, you know, today we do, we could do hardwood floors and do a, a, a blonde color hardwood floor. We could do bamboo floors. So there are materials and methods today that we can use to address that. Here back at the Schwartz house, again, here we have the wood railing, wood floor, wood wall, wood ceiling. We have the, the red or the kind of the reddish, the brownish color in the brick. So again, there's just kind of an overall general, there's a lot of this material and a lot of this color. Um, so again, if we could just have different materials um, on, on one or, or some of these surfaces, I think that would just help make it a little more interesting, help break up that monotony and address that issue of, of sort of just an overall sameness. Now, again, Mr. Wright, trying to create a continuity in the entire design inside and out using the same material. Um, and so we want to understand that. And if we want to um, understand and update the principles of organic architecture, where uh, you know inside and outside are the same, we want to think about that. So we want to we want to be really careful, and we want to think, okay, let's use materials on the outside that we know we're going to use on the inside. That's the key. Start with the outside material and what you want there. Thinking, okay, how can I how can I incorporate that inside? To controlling back at the Palmer House, which is designed on a triangular grid. So all there's there's angles in all of the furniture. The dining tables, uh, this, this corner is clipped off. The coffee tables here clipped at the same angle, the built-ins. So again, everything has to adhere to the grid, to the module and to the architecture. So again, here's the Palmer house. Here's that triangular grid. And you can see that the coffee table, the built-in, you know, everything, like clipping the corner here of the dining table, everything adhering to that grid, even the beds, the bed frames, the built-ins. So everything is sort of at the mercy of that grid. Now, again, we love that. That's what we love about Frank Lloyd Wright, a complete work of art inside and out, a complete continuity of design. And, 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 and it is fabulous. I mean, I remember staying in this house, taking a nap here on the bed, opened this little window uh, back here at, while it was raining. Ah, oh, it was just absolutely glorious. But most people are going to take issue with how inflexible this is. So today, what can we do? Create more flexibility still have integral design, but work with the client on choosing furniture that is um, a part of the design, um, integral with the architecture, but that is flexible, movable. You can take it with you when you move. Um, you can move it. You know, these built-ins here, you can't take it with you. You can't move it. So, you know, you are going to sit here now you'd want to because you're next to the fire and you're catching the view. But in, in today, if we could maybe 
maybe make it, you know, design furniture that appears, that looks built in, but that is actually movable. Uh, so this is one of the bedrooms in the Palmer house. And you can see um, how everything adheres to the triangular grid. I mean, we even have, you know, a parallelogram shaped table to adhere to the grid. The bed frame is, is clipped, the, the mattress adheres to the grid. So now you have to find somebody to custom make a mattress for you. Tricky, um, especially in today's world with supply chain labor shortage to try to get somebody to do that, it's gonna be really expensive. So again, if we can design for more flexibility, um, choosing furniture that can be purchased, that can be moved, and that can be um, moved to you know, a different home, um, that can be completely flexible, I think would improve. You know, here again, we have the hexagonal table. We have the built-in, can't take it with you. Um, the bed frame, uh, again, is, it's, it's very specific to this house. And again, Mr. Wright was, was doing that on, you know, purposely to create this work of art for this client. But um, then it just sort of becomes um, inflexible. And so let's address that criticism by building in more flexibility and the ability to take it with you. So uh, this is the floor plan of the Krause House in Missouri. So again, you know, this dining table, you know, everything kind of conforming to the grid lines. And that's just going to be very specific to that house. But when you move to a different house, unless it's got the same module, you're going to be hard pressed to put your dining table somewhere that makes sense. Um, so again, you see that you know everything is sort of has these angles in it, adhering to again another triangular grid, um, such as the Kraus house. Straight masculine lines all yang. Again, back to the Palmer house, not a curve in it. Um, so, and not even a sort of a soft edge or corner. Um, so again, it's very masculine, right? Um, yang is masculine, yin is feminine. So again, uh, it would be nice to have, uh, you know, may maybe somehow there is a there is a counterpoint to these straight lines. Um, maybe there's a and and Mr. Wright did this sometimes where he would have maybe a curved planter. Um, if you can incorporate maybe some curve somewhere here and there, incorporate some some softer edges maybe um, here and there throughout the. the the, throughout the design, just something to counterbalance all the straightness in the design might be um, beneficial. I mean, here's an elevation of falling water. Um, you know, it's just this really strict, severe adherence to the straight line. That's going to be very, it's very modernist and very, very masculine, very male. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, could be a, a criticism. Again, you just have all of these lines, very straight lines. Um, again, so if you're into feng shui, F-E-N-G-S-H-U-I, uh, Google that, research it. Um, but to have a balance between yin and yang, between you know, soft and hard, straight and curved, light, dark, um, I think you'll find that interesting and creating a, a very exciting space. Now, one could argue that, well, the yin is nature and the yin, here's the curve and here's the softness. And I would, I, would, I, I would agree with that criticism and that could be what's happening. Mr. Wright himself even said, uh, you know, on the one hand, I'm interested in nature. And on the other hand, I'm interested in the artificiality contrary to nature. And so <clears throat> there is the contrast between the man-made and nature and straight and, and curved. And so that may be the, the philosophy here and that could be acceptable, but just a, you know, again, in terms of the actual house itself, um, maybe, maybe look at, think about ways to maybe incorporate some counterpoints to all the maleness and all the straightness and all the yangness of the house. <clears throat> plain facade facing street. This is the Affleck house in Michigan. Blank walls, high clear story windows. This is probably a hallway 
Now, again, Mr. Wright did this for privacy. I mean, we don't want bedrooms here with large windows facing the street. True. But we're also, this is where, you know, homeowners drive up here, pull up here under the carport. The front door is here. Guests park here, maybe park here. And or then you take the drive, the circular drive out back onto the street, which is behind you here. But, you know, not very welcoming. I mean, um, there's a, um, um, you know, almost kind of looks like the back of the house is, is greeting you. It, it, it kind of puts you off. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not very welcoming. And so let's just think about things we can do. Is there, is there some other way to treat this, to handle this? This is the Hagen house. Carport is over here. Homeowners park here, enter the house here. This is the entry. Main fireplace core, living room is here. Hallway here, bedrooms here. This is the gravel forecourt. So this is where guests are going to park. And then this is where they're going to enter. But, you know, you have these blank walls. So just is there, is there, is there a better way to handle this? Is there a way to handle the criticism of, you know, that this is almost militaristic, this is almost fortress-like? Um, is there some detailing or way that we can treat the, 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 the walls here? I'm not saying uh, let's just, you know, put some, some decorative applique on these walls and pretty them up. Is there something, is there something integral to the design that can just be thought of here to maybe address that issue. You know, this is the, um, the house in Alabama, the Rosenbaum house, um, a Usonian. Again, um, you know, this house, I think I read uh, in the book about this house that the, the neighbors and people that live nearby called this, I think they called it the hen house, or they called it, or, you know, they said it looked like a storage building. And I mean, you got to admit, you can understand the criticism. There's just, you know, here's the front door, carport is here. Again, blank walls here, but windows above. Again, this is the living room here. So it, it's, it's affording you privacy from the street. So we have to recognize that there is a, there is a very rational reason for this. Um, you know, uh, it's building in privacy from the street. Um, but it's also very fortress-like and just doesn't present as welcoming a facade to visitors as maybe there could be. So let's just think about different ways that maybe we can, we can address that and create some interest here and some um, design strategies here that are integral to the overall architecture, but address this um, sort of blankness. Horizontality, not always applicable. Mr. Wright emphasized the horizontal um, because uh, he grew up in Wisconsin and he was relating his buildings to the prairie, the flatlands, the prairie, the Midwest. But when you're here in different parts of the country or the world where there isn't a horizontal line to be had, you're, you're not relating to the prairie. So is there, is there some way that we can address then the specific site? Now, you know, one could say, well, if the horizontal was emphasized here in this building, then that contrast to the surrounding would, would be a, a, a design philosophy and a design strategy, that it's that contrast between the man-made and nature <clears throat> that is acceptable. And you could make that argument, but, I think also just always automatically uh, designing to the horizontal, um, you know, maybe might not be the most appropriate uh, approach to certain sites. Now I've stretched this image to fit the screen, but again, this site is very vertical. There's a there's an extreme slope from here to here, and so you know maybe the vertical could be emphasized. Um, maybe maybe you could have parts of the house parallel with the slope. You know, maybe, maybe the roof lines could be parallel with the slope of the site and therefore make the house appear to grow up out of the site. You know, um, I'm gonna take, take just a break here 
and talk with you about. So I interviewed with Faye Jones, um, Frank Lloyd Wright's apprentice and a very famous architect in his own right who designed Thorn Crown Chapel uh, in Arkansas. And when I interviewed with him, he told me that he talked with Frank Lloyd Wright and that Frank Lloyd Wright said to him, Faye, all my life, I've been doing this. But you, you're doing this, do more. And Faye Jones told me that that sort of, that was his um, kind of way of, of saying he kind of got acceptance from Mr. Wright and that he could go on um, doing his work, which he did stress more of the vertical because he was building houses in the hills of Arkansas. And so um, it was just more appropriate to uh, kind of emphasize um, that, that more verticality um, rather than the horizontal. So uh, going back through here, um, let's catch up where we were and uh, get back to our slides here. So um, again, uh, if we can stress the vertical, um, then I think uh, that could be a different design approach um, rather than always just immediately going to the horizontal. Again, a very sloping site, steep roofs. Why? Get the snow off. They're probably metal panel. They are. So they're metal panel, snow slides off, steep to get that snow off. So there is a reason to not stress the horizontal when you get many feet of snow in an environment. So again, let's just be cognizant of um, where the, the project is, where the building is, um, and, and the, the nature of the site and the slopes. You know, again, here, this very steep side of a cliff. Um, uh, you know, and it, like I said before, in, in sites like in Washington, you know, where they get, I don't know how many inches of rain a year they get, um, but every time I've been there, um, it, it's, it's been raining, it's gray, it is just wet, it's cold, it's cool. Um, it's a beautiful place. I love it, especially living in Arizona. But, um, you know, to have a flat roof and to stress the horizontal when you're building on a slope, just there, so there, there may be a different approach and, and we, can, we can explore that today. Concealed kitchen or the workspace. So again, Mr. Wright invented the open plan. So the dining room and the living room are combined as one space, but here's that workspace where the kitchen concealed behind this wall here and behind this uh, built-in here. So here's that built-in dining table living but the kitchen is behind this wall here. Now you've got some peekaboo windows here, but you are not able to communicate with people here in the living space when you're in the kitchen. You're not gonna be watching the football game or, the, or TV from the kitchen. Now, again, today, you, you know, in a new design, you would never see this. So I think we have addressed this issue to a large extent. Um, again, this is the Schwartz house. You enter here, uh, again, here's the kitchen basically completely cut off from the living, a little bit of a connection here to the dining area. Um, but again, uh, let's, uh, you know, today we make sure that the, the kit, living kitchen dining, that's almost kind of a given as um, a continuity of those three spaces. So I think we're doing a, a, a better job, if not a, an excellent job of addressing that. Here's that kitchen area from the dining area concealed. Restrictive planning grids. This is the Lamberson house. Very odd grid system here. So Mr. Wright always designed on a grid um, to for uh, proportion and continuity of the floor plan. And then he would always typically um, have some sort of unit system in the, in the third dimension and the vertical. Sometimes it might adhere to the grid. Uh, sometimes it might adhere to the the material that was being used. So the module might be the board and batten or the brick or the concrete block. But um, so the grid was a way to organize the design and maintain um, the continuity. But here is an odd situation where we have, you know, a square grid, but then we have a part of the house at this angle. And we have these angles here that, that don't have anything to do with this grid. And then we have the grid changing 
Um, so this is this is tricky. And um, you have a lot of the house sort of not really even adhering to the grid line um, because they, they can be restrictive. Um, you know, in certain houses, Mr. Wright designed, he would have two different grid systems. Now, again, I, I know he had his reasons for that. I'm sure the view was probably out here and he's trying to capture that view. But, you know, here's the grid and you're either on the grid line, you know, here and here, or you're, or you're off it. Um, in this particular case, this adheres to the grid pretty well. But in some cases that I'll show you in the next slides, you have to go on, you know, like the half module, um, you know, in this particular grid, we're on the grid line here, but see this, this wall here in between the grid lines. And so this is going to raise the question of where, if we, if we go to the half grid, do we center the wall on the half grid? Do we favor one side of the wall on the half grid or the other side of the wall on the half grid? So now you, you begin to have to ask these questions. You know, for instance, here, here's the grid line that favors the inside of this wall. But the outside of the wall is, of course, not on the grid. In this particular case, it looks like, you know, here's the grid line. Looks like this particular wall is not on the grid line. It misses. So, for example, today, as an example, a tub, a standard tub is 60 inches long or five feet. Most standard bathrooms are typically five feet wide by, you know, six, seven, eight feet long. Well, if you design on a four foot module, you're either going to have to make that bathroom four feet wide, which you couldn't do because the tub is five feet. So now you'd have to get a, a custom tub or you have to make it six feet wide, in which case now you've just added a foot to the bathroom that maybe you didn't need and that just adds square footage to the house. So today, uh, uh, you don't necessarily see designs on many designs on grids. We understand why Mr. Wright did it and it is beautiful. And he had those grid lines scored in the Cherokee red concrete floor and those extend out to the exterior and it expresses the structure of the home, the module of the home, and that truth is expressed. And it is fabulous and it is beautiful, but we just have to be careful that um, sometimes um, you just don't need a wall on the grid module. And so you have to think about how you're gonna handle that and how that's gonna affect the design and the budget and things like that. Um, again, you know, here the grid line, but the grid skews here and changes. Um, you know, but again, you're you're on the grid line here, but you're sort of off the grid line here. You're off the grid line here, off the grid. Um, here is the half grid. So you know, here you know you're sort of in between the grids. So it's just it it's going to get tricky, and there are just going to be conditions. Like at this bathroom, you know, I think the half grid is, is here, but you've got a plumbing wall here that's thicker to get your plumbing in. Something's gonna be off the grid. So do you try to adhere super strictly to that grid and basically be a slave to it? Or do you abandon the grid when you need to? Or do you just not have a grid to begin with and just design your your structure, you know, align your structure so that your beams can line up, your columns can line up, and be cognizant of alignments and 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 be cognizant of some repetition. You know, maybe you use three foot doors and three foot wide windows and, and sort of have a grid in mind, but not express it and not be a slave to it. Now, there were times when Mr. Wright, actually, I think I read that he even said of his own grids, I'm not going to be a slave to my own grid. And there were times when an apprentice questioned Mr. Wright, you know, and maybe doing and maybe preparing the construction drawings for a house that, you know, hey, Mr. Wright, this wall is off the grid. And he would be okay with that. But because again, there are times when you just have to be. So again, a lot of this adhering to the grid, um, but then at times, at times, it's just not going to be able to.
um, again, the grid changing for the view. So we just need to be aware of that. Have an order, you know, maintain the order, maintain wall alignments for structure, just makes it easier to structure. Uh, be cognizant of your load bearing points, um, but maybe you don't have to have a two foot or a four foot grid throughout the entire project. Budget exceeded. Um, found some examples here where the client is, is uh, you know, talking about budget, informing Mr. Wright. Um, you know, in one of these visits, I asked Mr. Wright if we were staying within our sixty thousand dollar budget, which, by the way, that was that was a that was a big budget in the fifties. To which Mr. Wright replied, "My dear lady, I have no idea." Well, that house tallied up at ninety six thousand, so that's a third again beyond the budget. Uh, so that that's going to put the architect and the client and the contractor in a really, really tricky situation. Uh, the Krauses in Missouri here um, saying that they repeated that the maximum they could spend was thirty five thousand dollars. Well, when the Krauses started getting bids, builder after builder refused to bid on the project. One told the couple he stopped working on the rough bid when his estimate cost reached sixty thousand. His preliminary bid for the brickwork alone was 20,000. And the maximum they could spend was 35,000. So we're, 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 we're far exceeding the budget. And so, you know, nowadays, what we try to do early on with the client, you know, we prepare these, these rough, these to scale, these scaled block plan layouts very early in the process. I mean, this is way before creating a floor plan with wall thicknesses and doors and windows. We do a rough layout. This helps us determine our square footage. And we take this step-by-step -step process with the client. So, you know, with computers today, with the, with the software that we use, we can click on each of these rectangles and get a square footage and we can get a tally. And very early on in the process, you know, if a client comes and says, hey, I need a you know, I need a 3,000 square foot house, but I need these rooms at these sizes. And we design that, we lay that out, we can inform the client, hey, per your requirements, we're at 3,500 square feet, not 3,000. Well, you know, at whatever the cost per square foot is going to be, that's going to have a big impact on the, on the budget. So nowadays, you know, nowadays, as we all know, Life today is more about data. It's more about um, um, you know, information. And so um, we've got a lot more data today and a lot more analytics. And um, we can address that issue early on uh, much, much sooner. So instead of designing this layout, not informing the client of the square footage, doing the floor plans and all the construction drawings for permits, getting permits, getting bids, and then finding out at that bid phase that we're way, way over budget and we got to go back to the design and trim square footage down, make things smaller, simplify it, do different things. Now, now we're going backwards. We're having to redesign the project, takes more time, we communicate more now with the client upfront and, and budget cost overruns are just not acceptable today. Again, it's just too difficult a situation to be in with the client um, and something that we can address sooner and earlier on today so that we don't have that situation where we're getting bids that are way, way over budget. Not to say that bids still won't come in higher than expected or higher than estimated, higher than, than we want, especially today, but um, we can at least start to have that conversation sooner in the process. So to conclude, what today's talk was all about is being is the excitement of these criticisms of Frank Lloyd Wright's work that today we can actually do better. So for those, for, for all of you Frank Lloyd Wright fans out there and for everybody who's toured Frank Lloyd Wright buildings and loves Frank Lloyd Wright's work, think of how great those experiences are 
and then think about today, we can actually build better. We can have roofs that don't sag and don't leak. We can have double pane, better insulated windows and walls and roofs. We can have lighter, brighter, airy spaces. We can have hallways and doors and bedrooms that aren't too cramped feeling. Um, we can have materials that don't require as much maintenance, if not almost completely maintenance free. You know, I mean, we know that today we have no time to, uh, you know, we want to reduce our time maintaining our homes, cleaning homes. Um, and so if we can do that today with material selection, we can address that issue. We can address all of these issues today because we know the criticisms. We have the benefit of hindsight. Mr. Wright you know, didn't, but he was creating genius works of art that we all love. And at that time were the greatest houses I think ever built. And I think still today, Frank Lloyd Wright was the greatest architect of all time. I have, I have been in over a hundred buildings. My wife and I have spent uh, you know, rented these houses, some of these houses out. We've spent the night. We've experienced the rain, the sun, the fall leaves. Um, they are absolutely the most fabulous, fantastic homes and spaces you'll, will, you will have ever been in. They are life-changing. Read through the guest books. Um, they are fantastic. But that's what's most exciting is we can critically analyze the work and we can build upon it and improve upon it. So thank you all very much for being with me today. And until next time, we will uh, do another video and continue learning and about Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, we'll see you then. Bye-bye, everybody.